Test, test. Testing. Our audio is up. Testing, 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 testing. Okay, yeah. Sounding all right. Hi, everybody. Uh, could Paolo do a little? Hello. Can you hear me? Hi, hi, hi. Let me see. I'm. Yes. Oh, you're so loud and clear. Coming Beautiful. in loud and clear. So loud and clear. Okay. Well, push okay, back the right. microphone then. Awesome. Oh, awesome. It is so great to be back here at Thursday Night Live. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to a special uh, Thursday Night Live series. We are. Uh, we present to you Gone in a Flash, which is a new live streaming series, uh, both from the Mackenzie Art Gallery and to and a Neutral Ground Artist Run Center. Uh, so I'm Kat Blumke. I'm Jonathan Carroll. And we're both digital programs coordinators with the gallery um, from the Mackenzie Art Gallery. And in this new series, uh, we're looking at specifically at the upcoming dissolution of Adobe Flash. Uh, since 1996, Adobe Flash has introduced many artists to creating interactive, animated, and web-based work. But as some of you may know, at the end of this year, this powerful tool is being uh, permanently uh, removed from the internet. Uh, so over the next eight weeks, we're going to be bringing artists, digital archivists, and game designers onto our live stream to talk about digital art, technological obsolescence, and the future of digital art archiving. Um, as today's live stream audience, you're going to be playing a key role in the, in the uh, in the programming series. Uh, so you will be able to ask questions tonight in the chat box. So the chat box is located on the right hand side of the video, I'm flipped, if you're watching this on a computer or below the video if you are watching this on a tablet or mobile device. Uh, this is an important feature of any live stream because this is where you, the audience, can uh, tune in and give feedback. So whether you are watching this on Twitch, Facebook, or YouTube, we encourage you to ask questions in the chat box anytime. Uh, make sure, uh, if you can't seem to be able to access the chat, uh, make sure you're logged into the account on the platform that you are using to view this stream. Yeah, um, as always, our conversations about art and technology can only occur because of the land that facilitates every part of our life. Uh, we'd like to begin by acknowledging the land that we are gathered on for this live stream. Treaty 4 territory is the homeland of the Cree, the Soto, the Lakota, Nakota, Dakota, and Métis people. You're gathered wherever you might be. Um, we're also joined this evening by uh, Paolo Pedercini. Uh, Paolo is a game designer, artist, and educator. Uh, he teaches experimental game design, creative coding, and animation at Carnegie Mellon University. And Paolo's artistic practice deals with the relationship between electronic entertainment and ideology. Working under the project name Mole Industria, he produces video games addressing various social issues such as environmental justice, religion, and, and labor, and alienation. Um, Mole Industria uh, obtained extensive media coverage and critical acclaim while hopping between digital art, academia, game industry, media activism, and internet folk art. In addition to uh, Paolo's studio practice, he advocates for independent and socially conscious game making within and without artistic contexts. And Paolo is the director of Like Like, which is a neo arcade devoted to independent games and playful art in uh, Pittsburgh. Um, we're big fans of Paolo and his work, and so we're super excited to be uh, joined by him uh, tonight. And we're going to sort of go on a tour uh, through uh, Paolo's uh, work. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So, as you yeah, as you mentioned, uh, my most of my work is released under a project named Mall Industria, which means soft industry or soft factory. And it's a personal project, but I sometimes collaborate, and it's mostly a bunch of games, really. Um, yeah, uh, since 2003, I made about like 40, 45 games and projects, and uh, uh, they range uh, from, you know, agitprop vignettes about labor, gender, politics, uh, to more like sat satirical management games. This was was uh, about like kind of censorship. Uh, this was was like a series of uh, analog games uh, to be played at protests and rallies. This was uh, um, abstract uh, city building games about gentrification. 
Uh, this was like a VR game uh, about the history of the relationship between gays uh, and uh, violence, uh, like looking at things. Um, this was with um, Lekinia, another city building game for the Anthropocene, uh, using some uh, machine learning uh, tiles. Uh, this is a recent one. It's like a smell enable game in which you are... Uh, um, yeah, we were like playing as a dog. This is like a three three player soccer. Uh, this is uh, one that came out this year called the Democratic Socialist Simulator. So this is kind of like just like a sample. And uh, all this stuff is uh, um, like, mo I've been asked to talk about my, some of my work in the context of the death of Flash. And so I have to go back to the first decade of this project. So what you just seen is kind of like the second decade, <laughs> very, very quickly. So yeah, when I started making making games in 2003, there was no like indie gaming scene uh, and political and satirical games were very rare. Um, the references uh, I looked up to and the communities I was part of were, were mostly like media activism and net art. And so I kind of like started hearing about the issue of digital art preservation pretty early on uh, because uh, the ephemeral quality of internet artworks was uh, very clear, was absolutely clear. Um, because, you know, when art is made of communication and relies on websites and technologies that notoriously disappear very quickly, the whole like uh, bourgeois idea of like, you know, immortality through, through art uh, has to be thrown away. And also, you know, net art was, uh, you know, I'm talking about like uh, early net art and uh, late 90s, uh, early 2000, was very anti-art establishment. And in particular, was against the unique art object idea, the commodification of, you know, art objects. So most net art artworks, uh, net art artworks uh, didn't really have any physical incarnation. Uh, net art was performative. And so it involved like media interventions, uh, online mobilizations and pranks, uh, and uh, you kind of had to be there in order to experience many of these works. Uh, and uh, a lot of performance art is kind of like that as well, right? But it's documented through usually iconic photos and videos. So there is the, the documentation becomes the piece after the performance is, is done. Net art, not so much, because there's always like some kind of leftovers that survives, like pixelated screenshots or broken websites. But most of the project really can be can be understood essentially as stories, as uh, kind of like interventions. And most of the projects, uh, even there, even then, uh, at that point, were conceived to be stories, to be sort of like hearsay, something that the press can write about, something that people on the internet can share. It was a kind of like a conscious practice of myth making of or meme making, we'll call it now. Also, keep in mind that in the early 2000s, I was uh, in in Italy. I was, like, that's where I grew up, uh, and uh, under Berlusconi, which was a prime minister that rose to power by controlling centralized media like TV networks and publishing uh, magazines. So pretty much every progressive looked at the internet as an alternative, as a as a counter power back in Italy. So when I started making games, I was mostly interested in an, in an audience made of bored office workers, uh, bored teenagers, uh, bored you know housewives and uh, house husbands um, that sort of like consumed and share content online. Um, that uh, altogether, uh, I I figure like uh, altogether they formed this huge decentralized network. Uh, somebody called it uh, the board uh, world wide wide board board workers network uh, that was becoming as powerful as the traditional TV networks. Uh, so my goal was uh, to inject socially conscious and subversive culture in this flow of silly viral content. And now we call this content memes and all social media sort of embraced virality as the main paradigm, paradigm for uh, uh, content distribution, which is super problematic. But back then it was si still a, kind of like a subcultural phenomenon and it had like uh, quite, a, quite a bit of potential. I think it still does, but that back then it seemed like uh, uh, kind of like unexplored. Uh, so before YouTube and internet video, before broadband, flash games and animations uh, were kind of the biggest viral content along with like maybe chain email and things like that. Uh, because uh, the flash format 
uh, basically works this way. It, it stores visual information as uh, a vector data instead of pixels. So, so it doesn't require a fast internet connection. So imagine instead of storing all the pixels that make a circle, like one by one and all the colors related to that, to them, you sort of like save uh, one instruction that says, uh, uh, draw a circle at coordinate X and Y with a certain radius and color. And so, uh, so that, that, that's what kind of, kind of made uh, uh, Flash what it is, what it was. Um, and uh, you could have even like pretty simple games made by teenagers, so uh, kind of like racking up millions of views. Uh, and this was also thanks to an ecosystem of portals that sort of like figured out how to organize and monetize amateur Flash content. And they did so before social media and phone apps conquered the, the sort of like the all the fragmented attention that escaped traditional media. Um, and talking about the bits of time uh, between, uh, you know, between tasks, the sort of like the breaks, uh, the procrastination time uh, at work, uh, the sort of like negative space of an increasingly um, dom screen dominated life. Uh, so that's where flash content tend to fit, tend to end up. Uh, and so one day I decided, since I want to talk about some of my games, uh, one day I decided to make a game for McDonald's. It was a management game in which you control the production process uh, of hamburgers from uh, pastors to marketing. And uh, I made it without their permission. It was like a satirical game. It was like an anti-McDonald's game. Uh, because I wanted to include what you usually don't see in this kind of games, uh, uh, me, namely the negative externalities, pollution, unhealthy food, uh, growth hormones, uh, deforestation, bad jobs, manipulative marketing. So basically all the documented social and environmental costs, costs of the fast, fast food industry. So the idea was kind of like to recompose this a globally distributed process and let the player operate as the corporation in a system without accountability. Um, so it's a game you can't win. It's a game you sort of like figure out that you have to do all sort of like a, a morally questionable uh, things, uh, morally questionable uh, strategies in order to, you know, increase the profits. And uh, uh, you never really like reach an ending, a conclusion, because the investors are simply demanding more profits until the environment is depleted or you are uh, stopped by various social breakdowns uh, and or you just figure out a way to kind of like keep playing uh, for for a while. Um, so despite but despite its, its uh, anti-capitalistic uh, themes, uh, uh, this Flash game became quite popular with millions of views across different portals. Uh, and... Uh, um, you know, it's easier today to imagine games with a message or even anti-capitalist games being released commercially, uh, but it will also be harder, harder to publish uh, a game uh, that does this thing, that appropriates a re registered trademark uh, and adult themes uh, on the bigger commercial platforms, Steam, the App Store, and things like that. And I will get uh, to that point, like, in a second. So the... The death of Flash has been uh, greatly exaggerated. You know, we've been uh, talking about it for or, or like more than a decade. Uh, it's important to specify that what's really dying is, uh, what was really dying is the browser pl plugin, which is owned by Adobe and uh, originally allowed to display video and highly dynamic content before HTML could. Um, the plugin was uh, at some point installed virtually in all browsers. So Adobe, who didn't invent the plugin or Flash, uh, it belonged to another company called Macromedia that got purchased by Adobe. But they tried to leverage this market, you know, penetration uh, by creating a whole set of development tools around it. So they basically took this animation and web design tool and use it as a Trojan horse to reshape the world wide web around Adobe products, or at least that was the, the goal, the stated goal. And it was concerning, concerned a lot of people because the internet runs on open formats mostly, and you don't want one company to own the technology that you use to, you know, to read news, read the email, to work, and so on. So uh, 
also because of that HTML5, the more like a recent uh, iteration of HTML, which you know the, the stuff that our web pages are made of on the front end, uh, was designed uh, with features like video and a graphic canvas. They were meant to replicate uh, Flash functions. So essentially, they were ma meant to make the Flash plugin unnecessary to sort of like cover that gap that Fla the Flash was uh, sort of like uh, uh, taking care of, like polyfill. Uh, in the internet folklore, though, uh, what really killed Flash was uh, Steve Jobs. So that, that's something that is usually quoted when uh, when people are talking about the demise uh, of uh, the Flash plugin. Because in 2010, that's a long time ago in the technological terms, so Steve Jobs uh, himself, in a rather extraordinary act, published this open letter explaining why the Flash plug plugin was being uh, uh, blocked on uh, uh, iPhones and uh, smartphones and iPad then later. Uh, and uh, he basically mentioned open format, security, and battery consumption. But it was really a kind of like a business move. It was like a monopolistic company fighting a potential threat. Um, the App Store just launched, by the way, and provided similar games and similar dynamic application. They wanted it to kind of like fill that sort of like area and market that Flash portals were already kind of like filling. So uh, Apple wanted to get rid of the competition and control that marketplace. Uh, because, you know, when you're playing a Flash game uh, on the internet, Apple doesn't make any money. But when you're buying a game from the Apple Store, Apple takes 30% of the revenues and they also force the developers to pay a fee and use their proprietary te technologies and so on. So it's like a, a pretty, pretty huge deal. Um, and that's and that's platform capitalism for you, really. Like you have a dominant position in a specific field and uh, you try to start a rent making operation. You have, uh, you can have a popular oper operating system or a search engine or a popular game like Fortnite or a social network for college students uh, or a website for selling book or an MP3, pre MP3 player or a smartphone or a, you know, an app for calling cabs. Uh, but then like you expand, you use that kind of like success to create a frictionless market around it and you ban the competition and uh, eventually you collect a whole, with the hope of collect, collecting a cut of the revenues from anybody who wants to operate in that market. So to me, uh, Flash was more of a casualty of a platform war, a, pla a war between two platforms. And I think we will witness this kind of uh, enclosing and capturing maneuvers between tech monopolies for the, all the foreseeable capitalist future that we have. And, uh, and there's also another problem that uh, aside, uh, even if you don't care too much about monopolies or you know technical things, there is a problem is that what circulates in this marketplace is pretty much the entirety of our culture, TV, books, music, news, and games. Uh, so here's an, another game that I made like a bunch of years ago. It's called Phone Story. I gotta hit play. Uh, Phone Story is a kind of educational game about the manufacturing uh, of consumer electronics. That's how it starts. I don't know if you're hearing the voice. While I provide you with quality entertainment. Once upon a time, there were minerals resting in the bowels of the earth. One of these minerals called Coltan, is found in most electronic devices. Yeah. The anyway, supply is located in the Democratic the, Republic. The game the world. works like that. By the way, like, uh, are you? Uh, do you have the microphone on? Because I hear like a big whoosh. That is. That is. <laughs> I our, wonder if. That big oh, okay. whoosh oh, is yeah, possibly I, I think, our computer. <laughs> I think that's be, that's that that's better now. Yeah, yeah. I I think I, I'm I'm just afraid it will it will be broadcast. <laughs> anyway, uh, that's uh, that's. That's just to show you to show you that this is not a, a recorded video. We are really live. <laughs> so yeah, the, the phone story is basically uh, a, a simple game. It's not really a simulation that uh, takes uh, the user, like uh, the, the the phone starts, you know, with a face addressing the player as a user and. Uh, Takes uh, takes you through a um, guided tour of the various phases of the production of the phone that you're holding in your hand. So as as told by the phone itself. So there is this voiceover outlining the context of the scene. There are four scenes. So the first one talks about the 
uh, minerals, uh, rare minerals extracted in Congo that are used in uh, you know capacitors and electronics. So the second one is a reference to the uh, wave of suicides that were happening in uh, assembly uh, factories in China, in Foxconn. Uh, it was a big wave of suicide and the company responded not quite by fixing the problem. This, uh, workers were like literally exhausted and, and throwing themselves uh, off the building. Uh, and, and so like the response from the company was to install uh, safety nets to, to, to catch them. So this, this is like a, kind of like a dark humor interpretation of that, but not that far from uh, what really happened. And there are like a couple of other scenes, one that uh, that is, a, is more of a commentary on um, uh, di uh, digital obsolescence. So you're sort of like throwing uh, uh, digital consumerism uh, in general, so you're like in the West and throwing uh, phones, uh, 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 hysterical, you know, uh, fan, Apple fans that are uh, before they crash against the store. And uh, the final, um, yeah, the final scene is uh, uh, is at the end of the cycle, and so you're, you're re recycling uh, uh, the electronics uh, in uh, a pretty terrible condition. Yeah, and they're like pretty simple games. They're like they were kind of mim mimicking early iPhone games. They were like uh, a little bit more like physics games or relatively simple, simple things. And uh, you know, like this, this game passed the you know the approval process and got published uh, on uh, on the App Store. And uh, and then when it, they, they sort of realized what it was, uh, they banned it. Like they kind of like pulled off from the App Store uh, just two hours after the launch when uh, people were starting to talk about it. And uh, they had a couple of official reasons, but the main one was that the uh, a rather generic, uh, oh, it contains questionable content. Uh, and uh, the ban uh, um, kind of generated an interesting conversation about the cultural status of apps uh, and sort of like brought to attention the market censorship and the sort of like this chilling effect that can happen when you have a wall garden like the App Store in which you can sort of like unplug, pull out any... Uh, you know, any um, product that violates very, very broad generic rules. So, and uh, it also, yeah, highlighted the fact that Apple basically treats software in differently than music or books. Uh, like for Apple, software and games are not culture, really. Uh, phone Story was, yeah, like it was, uh, it was basically saying, uh, like, uh, this is actually from the Apple guidelines uh, from 2010 when, uh, when the game came out. Uh, that says, so uh, view apps differently than books and, or songs. If you want to criticize a religion, write a book. If you want to describe sex, write a book or a song uh, or create a medical app. It can get complicated, they admit, but we have to de decided to not allow certain kind of contents in the app store. So it's basically, it's, yeah, it's basically saying like uh, the, um, an app is more like uh, more like a screwdriver than, uh, you know, than an, um, a, a book. Um and uh, Phone Story was made in Flash, right? Uh, it was published and built for uh, for a smartphone, but it was made in Flash. And because because of that, it was possible to re-release the game for Android. Uh, um, so, like within a, now, a couple of hours, it was already available in, on the Android market, and it stayed there for about ten years. And uh, uh, and also for browser and as downloadable files. So and that was like very briefly in a couple of hours. If I had made uh, the game using you know Apple's prop proprietary tools and their their own frameworks, uh, it would have been much more difficult. I would have been beholden to that platform and to that technology. So that's uh, that, that's one interesting thing that f the the Flash was uh, allowing. Uh, so. Flash took, took a long time to die because uh, it was a development environment. It was just like it was a program, not just a browser plugin. And uh, it was quite quite a unique tool. Uh, it allowed to make uh, to make things that weren't really possible before or possible or really easy to make with other tools and still are impossible today or aren't quite easy to do today. Uh, Flash was centered around vector graphics uh, and animated timelines. So you could make an animation in a few seconds and make an interactive with, like, with a few lines of code. And uh, uh, it provided visual artists, uh, visual artists like me, I don't have a really strong background in computer science. Uh, it provided an entry point to game development. 
Um, so like I could make games entirely by myself without you know collaborating with a programmer, and uh, and I could make them very quickly. And to me, it was super important because I was making games that were uh, you know direct commentaries on what, what was going on. So I couldn't really like spend like a year. So because of the, maybe the issue I was trying to intervene in. Uh, would have been, uh, you know, old, old news, or, or um, the conversation would have moved on. So, um, so that that was quite quite a thing. And still today, I cannot make games as fast because I don't have uh, um, I don't have Flash anymore. So my first games were a little bit more than interactive animation. For example, this one is called Tubo Flex, and it's a kind of um, it kind of anticipates the gig economy, as we call as we call it today at that point it was still called like you know in italy it was called precarious labor and uh, uh flexible work and uh, the the game is set in a future in which uh, you're a temp worker uh there is actually a temp worker corporation that set up a system of pipes that allows them to relocate workers in real time uh, according to you know real-time market demands so you are starting you're starting here in the, you know, you know, working at McDonald's, and then you get sucked up in a pipe, and then you become a mole Santa, and uh, then you're sucked out again, and you're spit out, and you have to perform another under, underpaid job, and um, and so on, and like, and you end up like even like unemployed for for a bit, and you just can only scratch your belly. And eventually you run out of chances, like you have a kind of like a rating system and that is a bar. Uh, so every time you make a mistake, uh, like now, uh, you, there are all many games. So, so every time you, you make a mistake, you lose a chance and you eventually are ejected from the labor market and you end up as a, as a beggar. Um, so yeah, even the la- one of the last games I made in Flash would have been very difficult to make in another environment because uh, this game is very like animation based. It's not really like systematized. Has like it's seen its own it's its own uh, sort of like situation. Um, so this is a man. A man is a narrative game made. Uh, where is like a little bit of sound I can put. Um, it was made in collaboration with an author, Jim Moreau, who is Canadian. Uh, it's about a day in the life of a drone pilot in Nevada, and it, it imagines the sort of daily routine of this new kind of soldier. And uh, the game employs this two channel set up and uh, two channel gameplay, which is a form of solution to the disconnection that runs through the whole game. Um, and we were just trying to imagine the strange dissociation that a pilot of a pilot that is controlling a man aerial vehicles in Pakistan and then going home. Uh, I should play this, and then going home, uh, um, you know, to, to to his family at the end of the day uh, in his suburban house. The sort of like a, a breakdown of the front line and uh, you know the um, yeah the home front. So the, the story is linear, but instead of moving around a space, you sort of like wander in the subconscious of a character and you participate in its development. Uh, so you, are, you, de- you get to decide if the guy is like, you know, like a you know, patriotic uh, a jingoist uh, or, uh, you know, like a depressed, uh, uh, traumatized soldier. And you find yourself kind of constantly multitasking between two interfering activities. You're choosing to prioritize one aspect of a, over another. Uh, so while you are following and targeting a suspect, uh, uh, you uh, you can uh, um, you can have a small talk or even like a meaningful conversation with your colleague that is actually the pilot, and you can even flirt with her. And uh, these conversations are a way to explore issues of heroism, masculinity, ethics, and wars, and robotics, and so on. Um, so. Uh, when uh, this is not a game that I made, actually, I should have credited. This is by Vector Park. Um, so when uh, their plan to monopolize the web failed, uh, Adobe kind of quickly lost interest in Flash as a tool. Um, and uh, also at the same point, I should say that interest in the animated website faded as well. Um, like web design has been uh, like became a little bit more homogeneous and have been like optimized for usability and functionality. So website became more like a, 
rather bland uh, vectors for content and they stop being content themselves. That's something that Flash kind of like created, like the website itself uh, can be, you know, a, a, an art piece or can have like a personality. So this is not really what won <laughs> the war eventually, uh, like a uh, website aren't really supposed to be just functional. And if they are dynamic, they are dynamic in the sense that you can, uh, you know, interact with content and comment and, uh, and so on. Um, but a lot of people kept using Flash to make games, and of, often very successful and influential game like Windowsill by uh, Vector Park. Um, or uh, yeah, and uh, and it, it, it is totally possible that uh, like Adobe could have tur turned Flash into a full game engine like Unity, for example. But it really didn't seem to care. They kind of did the opposite. They uh, recently reverted to its original purpose as an animation tool and they rebranded it at animator because I guess, I, I guess the flash brand was a little bit cursed uh, and a little bit like uh, not valuable so they they, they they took the same program and uh, effectively killed all the interactive abilities that allowed allow people to make games so, so it's like a good animation tool still but it's more like in, you know in in the same uh, uh, in the same sphere as uh, you know photoshop or illustrator so uh, the point is that we are not just losing the artifacts now which has been uh, an issue with you know the plugin being uh, gradually phased out but we are also losing a whole mode of production a whole like palette of tools um, to be clear, there are still ways to use Flash today, um, but they are not very beginning, beginner friendly. As far as I know, Natalie Lawhead still uses Flash. Uh, and by the way, her style is so unique and so emancipated for, from the sort of like default uh, Flash aesthetic that many people don't even associate her work with the tool or like, uh, but, uh, but she's one of the most interesting, you know, Flash developers that are still using Flash. But, uh, but it's not like really easy, like it's not really the uh, developer friend, like it's not beginners friendly to, to, to be to be fair. You can still like use it, but it takes some alchemy and some uh, kind of convoluted frameworks to make it work. Um, but luckily there is also this project called Wick Editor that is a kind of recreation of the original Flash development and uh, it runs on browser, uh, still in progress, but it's just it's making quite a lot of progress, got sponsored by Mozilla and so on. And it uses only HTML and JavaScript and uh, other like open, uh, uh, open formats, SVG or and whatnot. So you can do the kind of animator, animation center games and application that popularize Flash uh, um, and uh, using, you know, like uh, publishing them for, you know, like in a standard compliant format. Uh, so the discontinuation of Flash to me, the application, the macro, you know, macromedia now like uh, Adobe Flash poses uh, a bigger threat to me to preservation than uh, the discontinuation of the plugin, because it means that even um, even if I had the source code, which is my case, I, has, I still have the project files of all the games. I still couldn't update and rebuild an old Flash game or you know, update it to make it work for newer situations and systems. And uh, I cannot do that because uh, because the, the the game is not like the the application is not available anymore. I will have to do things like using a pirated copy of Adobe Flash CS6 uh, on an old operating system, and then uh, uh, and then probably the build will not run on new operating systems anyway. So the stuff that makes those games is uh, actually being discontinued as well, and that's more of a problem because of the pretty conscious and uh, uh, inexplicable decision of Adobe to discontinue it as, a pro uh, as an interactive tool. So that's something that we don't really talk too much about it because we focus so much on the plugin. And uh, I've been wondering if future generations will rediscover, you know, rediscover Flash games, uh, uh, if, if Flash games will be included in the retro gaming practice, retro gaming or old school game gaming is, you know, something like huge and popular, uh, because if you think about it today, it's easier than ever to access uh, games from pre previous generations, thanks to two things, to a committed community maintaining uh, uh, archives uh, and emulators uh, basically like so like archives on one on one side people that are you know like getting old cartridges and uh, you know copying them uh, in uh, on computers or even like opening up uh, and just like uh, 
doing some circuit bending in order to extract the information if they are really old the games. And uh, another, like in, in a parallel community of people who are making emulators, who are making uh, um, basically programs that simulate all their hardware and operating system in order to run the original software. So you don't have to update the software, software you're just uh, pretend like making the software believe that it's running on an old machine and uh, the, the software like, referred as ROMs. And uh, I, for example, I was able to track down, so this is a, a, pro, a project, a side project of mine. I was able to track down and, pl and play two of the very first uh, art games from the 80s. Uh, one is called Lifespan, which is an, ar uh, an arcade allegory of the life of a person from childhood to death. And, uh, and the Dolphin's uh, Rune, which is a trippy game in which you play as a dolphin, and it's one of the inspired uh, uh, like that's that's that passage, but it's a similar <laughs> a similar conceptual conceptual game. Yeah, it, it starts like this. It's just like a very strange, ex experimental, very um, a bit hard uh, to understand. They were like very cryptic games and a little bit too ahead of their time. And so they were kind of basically forgotten at the point, uh, like at their, you know, at the, at the point they made some a bit, a bit of a splash because it was the, oh, can you believe games can be art uh, and then they're make, made by an artist, which is this John O'Neill. Um, so I was able to find the, the ROMs and play them and uh, piece together some uh, uh, information to figure out how they played. And then I even made a short documentary that is what you're seeing here without audio that sort of like puts them in context. You can find it on YouTube. Um, so, uh, uh, but here's a problem. Nintendo sort of like figured out that there is a market for classic gaming or retro gaming. So they released their own official emulator, like their own like physical emulated console, which is a miniature version of the Nintendo NES. And uh, uh, right after that, they in 2018, a couple of years ago, they started essentially suing and taking down all the website that distributed these ROMs, because obviously now these ROMs, these old games were becoming, you know, profitable. And, uh, and so they wanted to, you know, take down the competition. Uh, and they had their right to do so because uh, those, those websites were essentially like pirating, uh, uh, you know, copyrighted material and Nintendo had, you know, all the rights to claim that and so on. So, but the problem is that while this uh, little official console was uh, like only containing the most famous games, the games that people really, the most people really wanted to play, Mario and Zelda and whatever, uh, all, all this website, this ROM, ROM archives, preserved thousands of games and releases from all over the world. So they were they were forced to take down not only the Nintendo stuff, but to take down their whole business because they were like sued. Um, they had to pay like settlements and so on. Uh, and uh, they they will even um, preserve games that were never released commercially. So uh, another thing that is bigger a bigger threat to game preservation is uh, draconian copyright regimes or like very aggressive copyright you know inf uh, infringement and action. Uh, I would say even more than technological obsolescence per se. Um, so Flash games, by the way, can be emulated too. There are a few projects like this one, Raffle, that can run f uh, files on the browser uh, and it can seamlessly replace the Flash plugin. Um, so you can, I can even click a link and show you my McDonald's video games running at 99% okay uh, through this uh, emulate, emulator. And it took me like 10 minutes to set it up uh, and uh, you will see it, it, it looks exactly like the original. Uh, flash plugin version uh, and today archive.org announced that they are they have they are using that system so you can upload an old swf file no flash files and they will not only store it but also run it in uh, in the browser it still has uh, you know problems it can handle animation where very well and older games before action script 3 but uh, so like we're, we're, it's still in progress, but I'm confident that it will be fully fully functional soon, maybe in a couple of years. Um, so uh, so like obviously like there is also another thing that Adobe could publish the source of their plugin and the source of their runtimes and, and applications and the, the ones that they are not even publishing anymore that they are not making any profit, and they could make this emulation process uh, much easier to implement but they have nothing to lose and but i'm kind of like afraid that they are too uh 
um, ideologically and bureaucratically committed committed to intellectual property to do so, to just release their you know prize plugin, formerly prize now disgrace plugin. And besides, uh, Adobe is kind of known for not listening to users in general. They don't they don't, don't really have to care because they are an industry standard. So. Um, Unlike uh, Nintendo games, uh, Flash games are mostly independent, were mostly made by independent and amateur developers. So, so I don't think we're going to see big losses that undermine their archival and mass, you know. Uh, but uh, back in the day, in the golden age of Flash, say 2005, 6 to uh, maybe 10, uh, a lot of games were site locked, meaning that they will only run on uh, websites that were commissioned or sponsored by. Uh, so a website will be like, okay, give me the exclusive uh, to this content, not unlike uh, you know, um, you know, ne a Netflix exclusive or something like that, or an Apple Arcade uh, exclusive. And they were doing it on a smaller scale with like you know, just like teenager to making making a fun uh, viral game. And, uh, and so, like, uh, they, they will impose this sort of side lock. The game checks where it is, uh, and uh, it will stop running if it's not running on that particular domain. And uh, so it was like a very simple form of digital right management, essentially an anti-copyright uh, issue, because these games would uh, often be copied to, you know, illegally copied to other, you know, similar portals and services. So... Uh, so that is that is actually kind of like a bit of a problem because you can update the code, but it will still like the code, the properly running will still refuse to run on your computer or on a different website. Um, but there is a solution for that too. It's like a much more com complex solution. Oh, I mean, I don't know if it's much more complex, but it's definitely a complex solution from the user side. It's less seamlessly integrated. So this Flashpoint is a community-driven preservation project that recreates the server and the cl server client setup offline. So you're kind of like it's a it's a launcher that contains pretty much all the Flash games that ever made, <laughs> and uh, it also um, they make convince these games that are running on an old, uh, you know, player, and they are connecting uh, with a uh, with a website anyway. But it's a bit more complex and cumbersome project. It's several gigabytes of downloadable content. It's uh, you know Windows only, and so in the when talking about preservation, I think we also have to you know talk about accessibility. Sure, you can. Uh, probably always run even like the very first game, Space War, if you have you know, access to a mainframe, a PDP2 or whatever. So it's not that the game per se is lost forever, but it is not, like to me, it's almost like it doesn't really matter like if nobody can really play this whole game or uh, any form of it, any emulative form of it is still kind of lost. So um, I think preservation has an element of not just like putting something that works uh, in an archive and make sure that it keeps working, but also like how do you make it public, which is more the mission of uh, archive.org. Um, so a couple of years ago, uh, Apple made this funny video for their developers conference. Um, it's their sort of like internal um, conference. Uh, and they had this like video which you have a data center worker that accidentally unplugs a server in Cupertino and all the apps uh, and all the apps are uh, um, in the world uh, disappear and they call it the apocalypse uh, uh, is a world without apps and it's kind of like making fun of our uh, you know dependency on uh, Sorry, it's a bit loud, but I cannot, I cannot make it stop. <laughs> anyway, I, I'm gonna talk louder. It's kind of like making fun of our dependency to smartphones, but also kind of like accidentally highlight uh, a problem with centralized uh, apps and centralized uh, um, app distribution. Because it's really not a big, a big, it's not like a big stretch to say that one guy, a Cupertino, can make all apps disappear. Maybe it's not something that can happen instantly and not definitely not with like just up unplugging one server, perhaps, but almost. Because all apps uh, uh, today and uh, since forever kind of have to go through an authentication and authorization system and notarization system. Basically, Apple wants to make sure that all the developers are compliant and they are beholden to, the, to them, to their contract. Uh, the, and basically, like very more more concretely, they want to make sure that developers are paying a fee for the privilege of developing for Mac systems. So uh, this is kind of like 
this is bad if you are a developer, but if you're not a developer, you shouldn't, I mean, you don't care too much. It's kind of like not your business. But it, but in terms of preservation, this is even worse than the death of, of Flash because um, the digital decays happens way more quickly in the app store. Basically, you cannot, if you cannot actively maintain an app, uh, if you don't keep paying the developer fee, your app will disappear from the store and eventually will disappear from the people's devices because they will, you know, uh, upgrade, uh, you know, upgrade the, their system, the, update the system or get another computer or n- another device. And even if they are owning the app, uh, the app, uh, if the app is not being uh, uh, actively maintained uh, and, you know, like ported to new platforms and rebuilt using, uh, you know, the new tools, uh, it will not, uh, it will stop working. And uh, this is, this already happened, like tons of apps uh, have been already like disappearing that are way, you know, more recent than any Flash game I've ever made. Yeah. So artists and uh, independent creators usually, uh, guess what, they don't have the resources to keep them alive. Uh, art apps are not profitable. Uh, this is, uh, um, the, you don't see the caption, but it's uh, it's my colleague, Golan Levin's Yellowtail, who made this um, application back in, uh, I think, like the early 2000s, and then re-released it for for the iOS uh, from for smartphones in 2010, and uh, and it disappeared because um, I guess he couldn't like keep keep up with the thing; he didn't have time, and. Uh, Thousand of very like excellent, I would say, and uh, definitely recent apps uh, and games disappear every year, pretty much, uh, because of this force obsolescence or because membership or certificate expiration. This one is like from 2008, I think, I think, uh, and it's really, really a great. One of my favorite like toy app. You're sort of like uh, very well designed. Uh, you're caressing and petting uh, in fantasy animals. Uh, and it's, it's slick, it's cute, uh, and but there was some some problem that the developer had uh, change change address, and so the the game goes got, got like discontinued, um, and so it even disappeared from my you know from my phones, and uh, and this is happening also because backward compatibility backward uh, compatibility, which is uh, the idea of the hardware new hardware being able to run old software, is really not a profitable endeavor. If you're, um, you know, if Sony comes up with a new play, PlayStation, they tr- they really don't like the fact that it can play all their games. Uh, uh, they would rather you, you know, make uh, republish the old game as uh, you know a remastered version or something like that. Uh, but also. Uh, but also, like th- these games are disappearing because the d- dependencies required by disclosed platforms, the digital right management systems, and their uh, third-party components that make digital artworks extremely frail and vulnerable. Um, and this, and by the way, the stuff, uh, um, the st- the stuff made now in Unity or Unreal. Uh, is much more likely to disappear than Flash games. Uh, I'm afraid in the five, uh, no more than 10 years from now, I will be giving this very same talk, but about Unity games, uh, because uh, the two major operating systems, Windows and Mac, Mac OS, are trying uh, really hard to control what can run on your machines or our machines by pushing you toward their own marketplaces and blocking apps that are from the outside. And they do so even if you're an artist that has, you know, their shit together and uh, you know get their uh, you know their certificates uh, and uh, pr- they are making professionally you know apps and uh, and uh, software. Even if if they do so, they, they like the uh, this the access to this market uh, also introduces this kind of dependencies, it's, and it's the same for platforms like Steam. Um, so the official excuse is usually security, and uh, but usually the real reason is the ex- extraction of rent. Like increased security is just a side effect of a closed platform. And uh, the point I want to make is that as long as we have a general purpose computing machine, meaning actual computer that we can program and fully control, the emulation of digital artworks will be possible. Um, Free and open source software and open formats will make that work even easier, but it's not just that. Yeah. And, and I would say, like, as long as we have uh, uh, an internet in which we can freely share information, the collection and archival of games will be possible. So as long as we have uh, 
institutions like uh, Rhizome, who have been restoring net art works that have been obsolete and lost for a long time, or we have institutions like uh, archive.org and we recognize their value and we don't you know, sue them, uh, we can take care even of marginal and niche culture that doesn't have the pool of you know, a Pac-Man. And because yes, digital art is niche culture uh, compared to you know, Atari games. Uh, like the obstacles to digital pre preservation are not really technological, but they're more like techno-political. They are, they are uh, related to intellectual property regimes uh, and to the monopolistic maneuvers uh, of unregulated platform owners. So let me go good with this picture. This is from 1942, and it was taken in the city where I live, Pittsburgh. Uh, at that point, in 1942, uh, records were made of shellac, uh, not vinyl. And shellac was an important military resource. Uh, it was used for like coating uh, um, artillery shells uh, and other things related to the war effort. So during World War II, tons of old records were collected, uh, sometimes in a kind of like spectacular way, like uh, let's uh, help our you know fighting men on the front. Uh, they were collected and literally melted into bombs, into weaponry. And uh, the music industry wasn't very big in at that point. Uh, it's not that there were like that many records. So I'm sure a lot of recordings have been lost due to this wartime recycling or upcycling. But you know, like sometimes I think I think about that when I think about flash preservation. Like honestly, who who fucking cares? Like there were Nazis to fight. You know, like and today, like with a pandemic in progress, you know, a constitutional crisis brewing uh, in the United States, a ma major environmental crisis. I kind of find it difficult to care so much about all games, even my own all games. So, so to me, game preservation is worth talking about because it raises broader issues. Uh, uh, things like the inherent conflict between uh, long-term collective interest and short-term profit motive, or how the notion of you know freedom of speech, uh, intellectual property, and monopoly change under this platform capitalism. So as long as we are actually ta tackle these issues, uh, as long as we actually pay attention to this broader issue, I'm actually fine with losing some terrible Flash game from 20 years ago. And that's all I have to say. Uh, Thank you. That's awesome. We have to repurpose all the code from our Flash games and recycle it into the war effort or something. Yeah, there is a limit to that parallel, obviously. Yeah, the, <laughs> you cannot do that. Yeah, so. Code fights viruses. That's what the yeah. that's the new slogan. <laughs> um, that's love. That yeah, video was you. lovely too. That one, this one you just showed. Um, oh yes. For, uh, for, for folks uh, on the stream, this is where you can find um, Paolo's games as well as his uh, the work that he uh, curates uh, for, for Pittsburgh audiences as well as uh, currently also online, um, a really excellent oh. example of online gallery space. All right, because uh, I keep the, the slide here because usually I I'm like oh let's all hang out in my virtual gallery, uh, like like three D dot glitch dot me, which is something we can do so they can only not talk to me but also see me as uh, some kind of uh, iguana, because that's kind of like how it looks. So feel free to go there. I'm gonna I'm gonna log in now. Oh yeah, let's, we'll, we'll throw but, it up. But but you can still room. still hear me. Yeah. <laughs> um, if anyone has any questions that they'd like to drop into the chat, mm -hmm. um, feel free. Uh, we have a couple uh, that mm -hmm. uh, we were things that we were thinking about before, and then lots of things that uh, I am made to think of now after that presentation. But yeah, Kat, do you want to ask the first question? Yeah. Um. Uh. As so, I'm not sure if we've mentioned it in in your introduction or you or you mentioned it uh before but you teach uh experimental game design at carnegie mellon um and as you were mentioning uh sort of this uh uh the the possibility of the software you know unity coming to the possibility of, of softwares that we're all so familiar with using or use <laughs> this currently what we're loading in the background right now um that yes. this too will uh uh, come to an end under uh, uh, under the poss uh, the apples and uh, desire to own all games. Um, what do you do? Like, at, is there a way that you kind of approach teaching 
uh, these skills in the possibility that many that they might not relate to other platforms that uh, your students will have to be faced in the future? How do you kind of um, approach uh, teaching um, when the medium itself is always uh, at risk or of, of being lost or at least certainly being updated in a new software release? Right, right, right. That's, that's a, yeah, that's a good one. Well, I'm a, I'm in an art school. Oh, by the way, like if you if you see the the address, you can uh, you can send it to the chat. I don't have access oh, yeah. to the oh, chat. Right, so, yeah. uh, it's actually yeah, you, you can see it there. But yeah, um, I mean in a, in a way, uh, I teach in an art school, which is uh, not not a design school or like not a um, you know like not a computer games uh, sort of uh, school and program. So. Uh, the advantage of that or like the beauty of it. Oh, like we're, I have a visitor here. <laughs> um, here. The, the, uh, the advantage of that is that uh, we don't really focus too much on tools or just like uh, on, uh, I mean, it's both like uh, the good and bad of art school that like mm -hmm. students are kind of like mad at us because we don't prepare them enough uh, or like we don't give them like enough hard skills that are marketable. I mean, we do, but um, but it, we're not like super focused on that because they are supposed to, you know, be good artists first uh, and then like, uh, you know, they'll figure out the tools. So there is that. Um, and then, like, uh, we are definitely, like, I mean, we, we often have pretty tough conversation about, like, whether we should drop, uh, you know, like, uh, the whole Adobe suite, for example, not out of spite. Uh, I mean, I will do it out of spite, but <laughs> but it's also, as it will be, like, a very, you know, like, a pro pro professionally, you know, like, a sound, a, a sound move to do, because uh, uh, for many things like uh, Photoshop and Illustrator, uh, there are definitely, like, open source alternatives, or even even like low cost alternatives that uh, students can afford because now right now we are basically like uh, making them dependent to you know to certain software that is uh, that is you know free to them because they are paying their tuition and so they can access it through school but then like as soon as they graduate they have to pay you know like rent to to adobe because one thing that i didn't mention is that adobe didn't figure out their sort of like a platform capitalist move by uh, by controlling the web, but they did figure out how to make money forever without doing anything, which is uh, to, you know, to adopt a subscription model. So now you have, uh, instead of buying a software, you're just like uh, paying for, you know, your monthly, your, your monthly fee. Uh, yeah, and that's really like not that great. It might be great for some kind of, um, you know, um, freelancers, but not necessarily for, uh, for students. Um, yeah. I want to ask, uh, uh, give a question that uh, Tack has. Uh, so Tack says, how can, or ta yeah, sorry. Tack in the chat. <laughs> our, our colleague, uh, Tony McKenzie asked, how can you make your players uh, get the correct message from playing a video game? So for example, uh, Tack played the McDonald's game uh, back in the day, and he thought it was teaching me how to run an international burger chain. Right. So. So what do you mean, like uh, the uh, how do you do? I make sure that people like get that. <laughs> that it's uh, how, like yeah, yeah. the especially uh, if there's the um, anti-capitalism maybe is be, message is maybe being delivered through a satire or irony, especially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if like if I would make uh, uh, if I would make the same kind of games employing the same sort of like uh, dark humor strategies uh, today. Uh, I think there is uh, uh, there is a limit to that. Um, maybe we hit some limits to that. <laughs> But yeah, I don't know, like I definitely have like, uh, there, there's definitely like a percentage of people who played the game and thought it was like kind of like a serious, uh, maybe slightly cynical, uh, normal business simulation, but I, I'm fine with that. Um, it's, it's okay. Gotta say hello to this person. <laughs> don't lick the frogs, guys. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, yeah. So the uh, yeah, I, I don't. Uh, yeah, I don't have like a strong answer to that. To me, uh, it, it's enough to you know to to raise these questions. To me, it's about. It's not about like imparting a lesson. Oh, it's really bad that you know like uh, McDonald's have to deforest the Amazon to destroy the Amazon forest in order to you know to make burgers. 
it's not really the message. The message is more like, uh, oh, I guess this is what happens when you're operating in a world without any kind of accountability. And so, like, sure, you can, um, you know, you can be, you can enjoy being the bad guy, but then, like, you're going back to, you know, to, to work, you know, like, you're going back to the to your position that is probably more closer to the burger flipper than, uh, than the CEO of, of the McDonald's, statistically. Um, the, I was also wondering, sort of similar to, similar question to what Ta or what Kat was asking about in regards to, like, how does the, how do the, the sort of, uh, ephemerality of these and as well exploitative nature of the tools that we use to teach art, how does that affect you as an educator? But, um, as an artist, uh, we use, uh, Unity for everything we make and, um, uh what do you, do you have any advice for that <laughs> like with with the knowledge that it's uh will probably isn't a long-term strategy as an art maker it just doesn't seem like a thing that previous artists had to worry about their the tools that they're specializing in um yeah kind of disappearing paint being yeah 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 getting hard but at least you could still find new paint in the future <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, you know, like games have uh, have have always had a problem. Games and interactive art had always have a problem that, it, that they are not like directly transcodable, right? Like if you're making a video, like a film, it's just like relatively easy to go from digital and uh, even to upscale to you know uh, and any other format. That uh, there will be no issue with that. Uh, same thing for music. Uh, games are a whole other, other story because there is no like mechanical way to just like transfer it to that. Like pe the people who are making the emulators are kind of like typing each single line of code, so it's much harder. Like recently, I didn't show it because, uh, but it could have been uh, related. Uh, recently, I had um, an online show uh, uh, for like like uh, uh, that was about interactive movies. Right, like interactive movies that are like choose your own adventure movies. That there have been a few of them in uh, in history, in recent history, starting from 1967 or eight, uh, maybe 64. Like the very first experimental one uh, that was debuted debuted in uh, in Montreal, um, but it was like a Czech movie. But anyway, like these are like if you need, like if you go off format, if you're making a movie that uh, that needs some kind of like a, you know interaction, some kind of like nonlinearity. Um, there are various technological solutions for that, but they are not standards, and so you cannot really transfer them to new formats. So there was a movie that was meant to run on specific, uh, uh, in the 90s, uh, uh, was meant to run on specifically equipped uh, uh, movie theaters. So you had a joystick and you had to press, you know, left or right or, you know, like a, a couple of buttons and to control the story and the viewers will vote on what the protagonist does. So that that movie kind of like immediately disappeared because uh, the the <laughs> movie theaters uh, didn't really buy it or like it didn't, it, it wasn't successful. Uh, and then, uh, and then, kind of like re was res resuscitated uh, by by the DVD. They were like, oh, now the DVD kind of allows us to convert this uh, branching uh, uh, story into into a format that is now accessible to any everybody. And so you can. So there was like a time in which you, that, that movie was was accessible, but then like the DVD kind of disappeared, and uh, some encoding technologies that the DVD uses that they used to remake it disappeared as well so that movie got like technologically lost almost impossible to play and so i had to sort of like rip it and convert it to digital stuff and i did that did, did that for a couple of uh choose your own adventure movies and then you have netflix that is sort of like able to integrate it right so the form is still alive but um, it will be much uh, harder to, it will be easy to preserve, uh, you know, what the content was, but the experience of sort of like choosing that will be just uh, uh, a bit harder. Um, and sort of related to that, what, do you have any thoughts about the role that art institutions play? Because we're talking, this talk is happening in the context of uh, uh, this, uh, talking about Flash uh, in partnership with uh, both the place we work, which is McKenzie Art Gallery, and then also an artist run center, the artist run center in town New in Regina here, Neutral Ground. Um, yeah, what sort of role do uh, art institutions, art galleries, or artist run centers play, or can they play in the like uh, preservation of digital media art? 
Yeah, um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, like in terms of like uh, funding, you know, like that kind of stuff, uh, I, I think is valuable and expertise. Uh, uh, I think you're going to have Dragon from uh, Rhizome um, uh, talking in the next series. So, yeah, he'll probably like uh, mention that. I think it's like a representation of what an institution can do. Like, oh, here's a very like, you know, skilled person that develops this technology and supports a variety of artists and make sure that you know, they, they can uh, recover and, res, you know, re recreate their pieces. So I think that's uh, that's kind of important because nobody, like, again, because uh, art uh, can be very niche, uh, can, you know, can be like, uh, you know, related, it relates to a very small number of people. That doesn't mean that, you know, like, or at least there's a very number of people who are who have that passion or they are willing to take it as an hobby. In part, the fact that institutions exist it also means that, you don't need uh, you. Sh you shouldn't be needing, uh, you know, like a, a, a grassroots archival project uh, for uh, for digital art. Often, these digital artworks are existing collections, but not necessarily they are not necessarily public and so on. So I think, uh, yeah, there is like plenty of, you know, things that should, could be fixed and should be fixed by art institutions. Uh, and um, but yeah, but also I don't I don't know. Um, uh, it will be. I think it will be interesting in a couple of years to see what um, you know what in art institutions do. That ones that are collecting uh, interactive artworks, uh, uh, what what they do to preserve uh, even like their own collections. Because um, in some cases, it's, it might become more of a, ma a matter of not of emulation, but of restoration or sort of like recreating certain pieces that are broken. And uh, yeah, for my like some of the sampling like some some for like my limited uh, experience it seems that one of the approaches which is actually not terrible is to kind of like have a legacy ma machine that is that contains and runs your piece and you you have maybe two of them <laughs> and you put them in an archive and you don't ever do anything to them <laughs> so hopefully they will keep running um but you know, like when you're running a you know digital art interactive installation for you know many many hours, many days, uh, it might <laughs> it might eventually burn down. But that that seems to be like this the cheapest uh, uh, approach when you're when you're acquiring a, a piece, uh, put it in a in a completely unplugged uh, you know like not internet connected if it's not an internet artwork uh, machine and get like six machines like that and put them in a in a climate controlled. Uh, you know, storage space. Uh, so when one burns, uh, you can still hopefully plug in the new one and not let it collect connect to the internet for updates. <laughs> the same sort of, it's the same sort of conservatory uh, like approach that we take to the paintings that we store in a temperature controlled vault, I guess, in some ways. <laughs> I think it will. It might. It might end up being uh, like the the cheapest, the quickest way. Might might end up being uh, kind of similar to that. Excellent. Um, Kat, do you have any other questions? Uh, well, we're uh, running, or we've passed the hour, yes, and it's uh, it's thinking. a head. It's a bit later for Maybe. you. <laughs> Someone's just dancing into the room. Here. I <laughs> love that. All right. Although the gallery somebody, space is still... somebody figured out how to how to dance. Uh, yeah, you can uh, uh, rotate. Yeah, you can use the the thing to emote. I don't know what I'm doing here. Hip hop dance. Yeah, sure. Um, but yeah, feel free to hang out in my in my 3D gallery. That's like the yeah, very easy to maintain gallery. It doesn't require any staff. <laughs> <laughs> very uh, precarious labor gig economy. Uh, no, no employees necessary. Even. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you so yeah. much, Paolo. That was uh, such a wonderful. Um, start to this live streaming series i think it like almost provides us with sort of a bit of a thesis statement going forward for our next few live streamings as well as like talking about a lot of the people and things people will be having on to talk about and things we will be talking about in the next few yes um so for the audience who is uh here or hanging on the gallery, uh, the virtual gallery, we will be having the next program. Uh, as Paolo mentioned, um, it is a panel discussion um, with uh, Dragon Espinshid, uh, Jonas Rickner, and Clara Chen, um, who will be uh, talking about uh, di digital art archiving practices uh, in the context of both Adobe Flash and online work in general. Uh, and that'll be on Saturday. 
uh, November 28th at noon Regina time. So it's a little bit of a, a, a different time for different time zones. Um, but that, that'll be our next programming series. And Paolo, just maybe to reiterate, where can people find you uh, online to play all your games? <laughs> Uh, just Google me, Mall Industria. Just Google that; you'll find it. Yes. Awesome. Follow Thank you. this. Follow this. Uh, the titles up there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh yes, type that. Yes. <laughs> type that in. <laughs> Thank you so much, Paolo. It All was right. a, a fantastic evening. Thank you, everyone, for watching. I'm ending the stream now. Out video. Uh, oh right, I am putting on the out video. Yes. Yeah. All right.